Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. And welcome back to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute, a podcast where we break down and celebrate the films of Gene Wilder one minute at a time. I'm Alan Sanders. And I'm Walt Murray. And no guest today, but we are looking at the film Young Frankenstein, and we are almost through all of the opening credits. We've we've gone past Walt, the model on the hill. We've done the, the digital push as long as we can before we realize it's a model, and all of a sudden we cut to the courtyard. We're still panning across the courtyard, and a few credits left to roll. One that I think is going to be interesting coming up later in the film, which is the producer, Michael Gruskoff, who is the producer of Young Frankenstein. Later, there is a guest house in town in the village listed as the Gruskoff house and it is a shout out to their producer yeah that's interesting and and michael groskoff is kind of an interesting guy he's got a lot of credits under his belt and he is still working today and um i noticed coming out in 2018 which is the year that we're in as we're uh, doing these he is working on a documentary called stunt woman the untold hollywood story and apparently he feels like uh, stunt women in hollywood have gotten the short end of the stick haven't been recognized like they should and this is a documentary drama of the the life of stunt women in Hollywood. Huh. So remember that TV show with Lee Majors, The Fall yes. Guy? Yeah. So well, I guess to, if they're going to turn it into, like, see if they can find the, the, the female version of, who was it that played the bionic woman? Jamie uh, Summers? Uh, yes. Uh, boy. Yeah, Jamie. That was her that name. That was the character's name. It was Jamie Summers. But um, it was played by Li- Lindsay Wagner. Lindsay Wagner. Yes, Lindsay Wagner. You. So they got to get a, like a Lindsay Wagner to turn around and we'll call it the fall lady. The fall, the fall girl. <laughs> Yeah, I can't call it the fall gal. <laughs> no, that would be that would be wrong. <laughs> no, um, but yeah, that, so the I, untold I that kind story of, of Hollywood the stunt untold women. story. Uh, good to see him still working. Uh, that's kind of an interesting uh, turn in his career, but uh, I guess we'll look forward to that coming out. Well, it's good to know that because a lot of the people that worked in this movie are no longer with no us. No longer with us. Yes. As we continue moving into the scene, we are pushing into the window where we can just make out a fireplace in the background, and we see something big and blocky in front of the fireplace and just as we're starting to kind of get some detail we get one of the final credits directed by none other than the master of comedy at least at this time mel Mel brooks Brooks. yes and um the tone is really dark you know you you definitely have a sense of something ominous is coming something heavy is coming and uh yeah there's been nothing funny so far in the first four minutes here of, of of young frankenstein not uh not joke one in fact if I were seeing this for the first time, not knowing what Mel Brooks is, you know, known for, what Gene Wilder is known for. I would be thinking I'm watching a throwback horror. Yes, I'm about to watch a remake of of the original Frankenstein. All right, well, let's take a minute here. I want to I want to ask you a question now, Walt, because we're 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 fans of Mel Brooks. Do you have a favorite Mel Brooks movie? This is obviously he's worked with Gene Wilder on only three of his films. Gene Wilder and Brooks were friends, but they only did three films together. But uh, do you have a favorite Mel Brooks film? Um. Or is this it? I think this is it. I do go back and forth between this and Blazing Saddles. And, and I guess, really, two of them, the two of them have a very different mood and a very different uh, style of comedy to them. Most of the time, I think if I was going to sit down and watch a Mel Brooks movie, it would probably be Blazing Saddles. But it's close. It's close. Because I really do love Young Frankenstein. Yeah, Blazing Saddles is, is my all-time favorite of Mel Brooks's movies, but I think a good second, because I was raised with my mom watching Hitchcock movies, I love High Anxiety. The fact that he plays Great on movie. so many of the Hitchcock films mm-hmm. within the overall story, and yet still tells his own version of a Hitchcock you know, suspense tale, love High Anxiety. I remember when that movie came it. out. I got it. And I, I was like, it. I ain't got it. <laughs> Well, when it came out, I was like, I have no idea what that movie is about. But when I saw it a little bit later, it, it, again, I mean, it's a home run for him. <gasps> Professor Little Old Man. Little Old Man. Little Old Man. <laughs> little Old Man. <laughs> little Old Man. Remember when they turned him around and he's like, his guy's eyes wide open, he looks dead. It's like, oh my God, he's dead. He's like, what? Who? Who's dead? It's like, oh, that's how I sleep. Scares the hell out of people. <laughs> Classic Mel Brooks line. Oh, it's fantastic, man. <laughs> then somebody throws a rock through the window, but it's like the size of a boulder with a note attached <laughs> a note to it. Attached. Like, how did they throw that up here? Catapult. <laughs> <laughs> 
great movie. If you've not seen that, I, I almost wish Gene Wilder had been in High oh, Anxiety just so we could do that as part of this podcast. But you know what? That that lends itself to maybe a bonus episode somewhere sure. down the line. Yeah, that one may be fun just to take a look at the movie. Because again, you've got Cloris Leachman in that. You've got Harvey Corman in that. You've got is it Madeline Kahn's in that. Madeline Kahn. Yeah. And of course, Mel Brooks starring in that. Well, and we could spend half an hour on uh, on Harvey Corman and, uh, and his works. And we'll, of course, when we get to Blazing Saddles, get to talk about him some. All right, we continue to push into the window. The lightning crashes, the thunder roars. We hear the return of all of the instruments in the orchestra versus just hearing the violin lullaby. And we realize we are wrapping up our credits and pushing all the way into the window. Now, it does an interesting thing here. As we push into the window, it actually goes from the fireplace to a clock on the wall. A clock set at midnight. Actually, I think that's a grandfather clock. It is midnight and it is tolling 12 right now. You have the old style fireplace tools, the uh, fire in the fireplace. Now, what's interesting about this shot is it's a long tracking shot that starts on the clock, goes to the fireplace. Then, as you realize as it's pushing across the fireplace, there's what looks to be a coffin in the middle of the room. And so it starts to thou pull back along the edge of the coffin. Now, from a camera operator perspective, I can tell you this, in terms of pulling focus, they did a really good job of making sure that whatever's closest to the center of the frame, which you're supposed to be keeping your eye on, stays in focus. And so when you're going from something that's across the room, then pulling down, you're, you're constantly having to adjust focus so that way it doesn't look blurry as you've shifted from one object to the other. And now we're tracking along this object and <laughs> that's where it ends. And that's where it ends. Well, and, and it's it's kind of interesting as you look at it because you see that there's a, a very ornate handle, kind of has that uh, German look to it. Uh, I think it's an eagle that's on there. You have a uh, the panning sequence, which I think we've talked about, or I know we've talked about. It's one of the few panning sequences in this movie. So we have that established tone that they're continuing with as they pan up the side of that coffin. Now, we are, obviously, we are in Frankenstein's castle. We've established that based on the opening shot, going up to the castle. We are going now through the courtyard. We, we pass past the front doors, and we zoom in through the, uh, I guess, a sort of stained glass style windows, but they're not stained. It's just sort of that style of... The, kind of the lead glass. Lead glass with a lot of the mm-hmm. intricate metalwork in between. And then we don't get to see much beyond just the edge of the coffin. So once again, we're seeing very little to let us believe that this is a comedy. Oh, yeah, this... This does not have a comic feel at all. Knowing what's coming in the next couple of minutes, it's a great start. It it really sets a great tone. And Mel Brooks and Gene Wilder, these guys are real geniuses because there's a slight bait and switch coming, but not a dramatic bait and switch coming. And, you know, kind of that move from hardcore, you know, where's Frankenstein going to jump out and grab you into more of the flow of the rest of the movie. So when it, when it comes to this film, when you were in the theater, and since we don't have a whole lot left to talk about until the next minute, I want to ask you this. Do you remember, did you think you were in the wrong movie? Because our, I, and let me tell you a story first. And the reason I say that is the first time I saw 1941 was in the oh, theater, right? Mm-hmm. Which but for some reason, I know it's one of his flops, but I still think it's hysterical. I love I, I think <laughs> when the girl and I remember having had seen Jaws. And so we're in the theater and the movie starts. And I was a younger kid and I'm sitting there and this girl pulls up and I was like, well, I don't remember the girl in Jaws driving up. She was on the beach. But all of a sudden I see this girl like go run down the beach, take her clothes and they all start flying off. I'm like, wait, maybe this is Jaws. Did they just do a different open? I was like, I remember. I said to my mom and dad, like, I think we're in the wrong movie. Like, no, we're in the right movie. Like, but this is Jaws. This isn't this isn't 1941. It's supposed to be like World War II and and you know zany and crazy and funny and, and this this is where she gets eaten by the shark and I don't want to see this on the big screen. I've only seen it on the little screen and and that gave me nightmares for like two weeks. Yeah, and then you had the bait and switch. I did. I did have the bait and switch. I remember that distinct, distinctly when the periscope comes up and she's like, Wah! she then up the whole time on the top of the Japanese uh, submarine. And I was like, oh okay, so this is 1941. But did you think? Uh, knowing that this was supposed to be a comedy, because I know the television ads made you realize it's a comedy. Did you think you were in the right movie? Well, at first I was I was really confused, and then I kept seeing Mel Brooks, you know, uh, Gene's name, and other people. And I was like, 
I'm in the right movie, but this doesn't seem right. And uh, it was a little, the music a little for me odd... even throw, threw me at the beginning of Young Frankenstein. I mean, I understand now why, but I mean, it starts off with this big dun dun dun, and like, oh my gosh, it's gonna be, and then all of a sudden it's like, mm, turns into a lullaby. I'm like, what? Yeah. What's going on? And it and then it felt old and it felt slow and then the lightning and then all of a sudden it gets ominous again and now we see a coffin and I'm like, this is not a fun yeah, movie. What is going on here? And it did seem very non comedy ish as I was watching it the first time. You know, if, if, you know, getting ready for this to uh, for the for the for the podcast, I had to go back and watch Young Frankenstein several times and I still to this day do not remember this open. I remember the push into the castle. I remember the courtyard. I I totally forgot about the whole casket, which is weird because you would think that's a pretty big thing to not have, you know, in the forefront of your mind. But I remembered all these other jokes. I remember all the walk the way, walk this way. I remember, you know, the, the Abbey normal, all the stuff that we're going to get into. I totally had forgotten about the casket. Well, when I saw this with my brother and my friend Tom, this was the first joke we talked about when we walked out of the movie. We were like, can you believe that at the beginning that, you know, we'll get into it in the next minute. But this was the first one we talked about. And I think it was because it was such a dramatic shift in the tone of the movie. And it really was a great setup and a great way to start off and go, no, wait a minute. We're just going to remind you this is a comedy. It's got some serious tone, but it's a comedy. It really gets you ready for the roller coaster ride that's coming. All right. So this movie came out 1974. This is 44 years ago this year. Amazing. Do you think an audience that may have never seen this movie before, at this point, if they're listening to the podcast going, okay, I'm watching one minute along with you. I don't see anything worthwhile so far. I hear you guys. Do you think an audience of today would appreciate the movie as we did 40-some years ago when we first saw it? Well, I'll give you a microcosm study real quick. A couple guys at work who are, you know, early 20s, they had not even heard of the movie. So, oh <laughs> but think of who it is. You know, you know that one of them is going to be a guest on the show uh, later on in the podcast. <laughs> so I gave them a copy of mine and threatened their lives if they lost it because I've lost so many over the years. And uh, they came back the next day and they said that they actually watched it at their parents' house. And they, when they walked in with it, their dad was like, that is a great movie. Where did you get this? I haven't seen this in years. And so they sat down as a family and watched it. And then the dad wanted to keep it one more night because he wanted to watch it again. And the two guys, um, Matt Gray being one of them, just raved about the movie. And for probably 20 minutes, we went back and forth with one-liners. And throughout the next couple of days at work, those one-liners kept coming back and back and back. And now everybody in our office is like, okay, i got to watch that movie again. So I think it has enough of a fresh feel to it. Um, but also... Having been set as a period piece, it is. It does have kind of a timeless element to it. That's an interesting, interesting take on that. Yeah, you're right, because it does feel like you're watching an old movie, and so you just kind of feel like, okay, it's an old movie. This is how it's supposed to look. Right, and I, and I think that maybe was an accidental stroke of genius on their part, maybe. Maybe that's what they thought about it. But it, it really does kind of catch you into that older genre of movies, that film noir kind of feel, then throws in the hardcore comedy that you can't get away from. And now, I think that if this movie were to air today, which it could, it's one of the, it is one of the Gene Wilder Mel Brooks movies that you could just put on network television as a Tuesday night movie and edit very little out of it and not have a whole bunch of social controversy over it. And I think that a lot of people would come to appreciate more and more what this movie is. You know, it's, I noticed in your story you said that these younger guys saw it with their parents. Do you think that was part of the connection, maybe? That had they just sat down with just a bunch of 20-somethings would it have had that same impact as versus saying, oh, my God, my dad's cracking up, so I'm laughing as much at my dad cracking up as I am at what's on the screen? And that's a good question. I don't know. And, and I'm wanting my daughter, who who is about to start college, to get some of her friends together and watch it because I'm really curious to see what they think about it. I think they'll really enjoy it. I, I think it's one of those movies that has humor kind of timely to 1974. Yeah, it's not, it's not spoofing like, unfortunately, Men in Tights. Right. which was hysterical a couple of years after the Kevin Costner Robin Hood. Right. That was fine. But you go back and watch Men in Tights, you're like, it's not as funny. Yeah, and you'll see comedies today and you're like, yeah, a teenager's not going to know what the Cold War was or they can't relate to that or you show your kids war games and they look at you like, Great. Shall we and, play a game? Yeah. What is that they're playing they're only on? playing tic-tac-toe for yeah. over and over and over again. I thought this was a <laughs> nuclear war movie. Why is he connecting his phone yeah, to a computer? What's wrong with my mom and dad? <laughs> they got impressed by tic-tac-toe and the Whopper? <laughs> they call the freaking computer the Whopper? Yeah, it makes no oh. sense. <laughs> my parents are idiots. Why? Because they want it their way? <laughs> <laughs> Whopper. Yeah, I, I think... 
this movie kind of stands separately from those movies in that I, I think that kids today could relate to it and understand it. And it is a story of an outsider, a couple of outsiders, you know, both Dr. Frankenstein and the Frankenstein monster. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> And you have the elements of understanding, you know, for Dr. Frankenstein, understanding who he is and embracing that in a very crazy way. Well, at some point, it. realizing there is a family name, whether I say it a different way or not, That's I'm right. still connected to this. Yeah. And I think for folks our age that there's some of that, too, of, you know, at one point in our lives, we were saying, I'm not going to parent like my parents did. And then you sit here now going, I parented exactly like my parents did. And and I think there are elements of that all through this movie. Well, if you are a youngin, if you're uh, um, millennials, millennials, if you're yes. pre if you're pre millennial, even or a millennial or or Gen Y or Gen Web, or if you're a younger folk listening to this, come on over to our Facebook page. Let us know. What did you think when you decided, hey, I'm going to check this out and see what these guys are talking about. Did you like it? Had you been shown it maybe by a, a parent who grew up like as we did, revering these kinds of movies and you know quoting these kinds of lines incessantly with, to one another at, <laughs> at sleepovers and now apparently at work parties. So Yeah, and on Facebook and everywhere else. <laughs> and everywhere else where, where they'll let us be <laughs> without going to Facebook jail or something. All right, well, hey, we ought to, I want to give a quick shout out here to a couple of folks that really started off this whole Movies by Minutes idea and uh, not even that long ago, but Adam and Brad of Gutterballs, Gutterballs.tv, first analyzing a movie one minute at a time. And a big, a big shout out to uh, Pete and Alex of the Star Wars Minute. You can find them StarWarsMinute.com, who created the daily format that we are following here with The Wilder Ride, and a lot of other good movies are being broken down and, and discussed. And if you go to MoviesByMinutes.com, you can get a full breakdown of all of those different podcasts. And there are some fun ones out there. There, uh, As I look through that list, there are several that I want to get on and, and uh, check out here in the near future. And with that said, anything else for minute number four before we wrap up the week tomorrow. No, just going to um, encourage everybody, if you like what you hear, please go over to um, any of the places where you can rate us, but uh, we would really love it if you would go to iTunes, and if you like what you're hearing, give us a five-star rating and make a comment just so your uh, your vote will be tallied, and uh, let us know what you think, let us know if you have any questions, comments, whatever, and we really do appreciate you listening and, and taking a minute or two uh, to give us those ratings. Yeah, we are on iTunes, but we're also on Google Play, we're on Stitcher. Uh, of course, our webpage is thewilderride.com. We'll have an entire episode page. You can get that. Uh, we actually put our episodes out on Facebook and Twitter. So follow us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. And in fact, we've even got a, a listener group. If you want to really get involved in the conversation, share some of your thoughts and memories of any of the Gene Wilder movies or heck, movies in general, we'll, we'll, we'll engage. We like our audience. Well, and it's interesting just even in the last couple of weeks when we've been working on that page, how much news has come out about different people involved in uh, these movies. So uh, great place to keep up with um, some of the folks involved. All right. Well, come on back tomorrow. We wrap up our first full week of The Wilder Ride getting wilder by the minute. And hear more about Dr. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Oh, Frankenstein. 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 Froderick? (laughs) Michael. (laughs) 